Electron cryomicroscopy makes use of the tool, the instrument, an electron microscope. And obviously, this could not have been conceived of before the discovery of electrons around about 1900 uh, by J.J. Thompson, the discovery of the electron. Recently, we had the 100th anniversary of the discovery of the electron. So once it was known that from the wave particle duality that electrons could be focused uh, just like uh, light waves, the idea of the electron microscope came in with Ernst Ruska. And the great advantage there is that the wavelength of uh, an illuminating uh, field of electrons rather than light, the wavelength is something like 100,000 times smaller. So light has a wavelength of about one micrometer. Uh, electrons have a wavelength of one picometer, something like that. So in principle, you can get a much higher resolution, but technically, there were many, many challenges. So it wasn't until probably the 50s and 60s that electron microscopes became capable of resolving atoms. Um, and then the biologists were always somewhat, somewhat behind the users of electron microscopes that were looking at metals and things like that. And the reason for that is when you put a beam of electrons on a specimen that is biological, made up of organic molecules, you get radiation damage and this destroys the structure. And in all the early attempts to do electron microscopy of biological structures, specimen was destroyed. So all the applications of electron microscopy originally uh, used methods that tried to stain the biological structures with heavy metals to, uh, to copy what the material scientists and the metallurgists were doing. And it wasn't probably until the work of um, Bob Glazer, who's uh, currently at Berkeley still, uh, emeritus scientist, he pointed out that radiation damage, so that means electrons going through the specimen, breaking bonds and, and changing the structure from what it was uh, in, in biology, proteins and lipids and so on, into um, burned products. So, you know, you, you break off uh, hydrogen atoms, they're given off as a gas, and you're left with a, a, a remnant of what the structure was. He, Glazer pointed out that you could never determine the structure of single molecules because of radiation damage. And he advocated using uh, crystals, which is a way of uh, finding out uh, how these structures um, interact with electrons Without dis so you, you've got a structure consisting of perhaps 10,000 molecules and you can get structural information even though you've destroyed a few of them. So um, Glazer was the very first person with his students at Berkeley to try the idea of overcoming or reducing radiation damage by cooling the specimen. And they cooled it to, roughly speaking, minus 100 degrees Celsius. Um, that was the furthest they could go because the electron microscopes had really bad vacuums. They would be contaminated and so on. So it wasn't until about 1980 that better vacuums, better cold stages, that's for cooling the specimen to low temperatures, allowed you to reach the temperature of liquid nitrogen. Um, and it was the work of Jacques Dubochet's group at the European Molecular Biology Laboratory in Heidelberg. He studied the behavior of water, which is the environment in which all of the biological structures are normally found. He studied it for three, four, five years. He studied when you freeze water, it forms a crystal, ice. Sometimes the ice is a hexagonal crystal, sometimes it's cubic, but if you freeze it very rapidly, it forms amorphous ice. And he developed a method for making a thin film by blotting a thin film of it. Um, and plunging it into, initially they tried liquid nitrogen, but because it's uh, nearly at the boiling point and you have a gas, the cooling is too slow and you get a crystal. So the current method that he invented was you have liquid ethane or liquid propane cooled to the temperature of liquid nitrogen, but still a liquid. So the liquid ethane then is at its freezing point. So when you put your thin film of water into it, uh, you've got about 100 degrees Celsius uh, temperature range 
between the freezing point and the boiling point of liquid ethane. That freezes it and gives you a very thin film of amorphous ice. And so I think the true uh, beginning of electron cryo microscopy came from the work of Dubochet. And uh, at that time, we were working on 2D crystals of a protein called bacteriodopsin. We worked initially at room temperature. We didn't cool it. By cooling it to liquid nitrogen temperature, we could get uh, four or five times as much data from the images before radiation damage. So cooling the specimen doesn't stop radiation damage, but it stops the consequences of radiation damage by about a factor of four or five. And so we were using uh, electron cry microscopy to, to determine the structure of two-dimensional crystals. But the real power of electron cry microscopy comes from being able to freeze anything. You can freeze uh, pieces of tissue, you can freeze solutions of molecules, suspensions of viruses, you can freeze ribosomes, you can do virtually anything. And so now, uh, electron cryo microscopy covers a span of about four or five different types of specimen. And each one of these are uh, interesting in themselves and give you an insight into different types of biology. Uh, the simplest one is to freeze a suspension of what we call now single particles. Um, for example, if you take ribosomes, uh, the site of protein synthesis from different types of cells, you can freeze a thin film of ribosomes. You see all the ribosomes individually uh, imaged in different orientations. You can pick out the ribosomes, and if you have enough of them, 10 or 20,000 at the moment, you can average all those different views of the ribosome and come up with a 3D structure much as you do tomography. For example, if you have a brain tumor and you go into a hospital, you take x-rays from different angles and you reconstitute, you get a three-dimensional image of your brain, your eyes, and the tumor. So we do the same thing in uh, structural biology using electron cryo microscopy. And you can do it with single particles without any symmetry, but then you have to take views from all the different angles. A second specimen are uh, structures in biology with some symmetry. So for example, viruses, they have, many of them have, they are spherical particles that have icosahedral symmetry. And that means they have five-fold, three-fold, and two-fold axes that go through the particle. And in each of the icosahedral particles, you have 60 copies, 60 different views. So you get one view of an icosahedral particle, and essentially you're looking at the subunits that make up that virus from 60 different uh, directions. So to find this 3D structure of a virus, you need 60 times fewer views than you need of a single particle, if it's the same size. And then um, you can get many structures in biology that form helical arrangements. So the alpha helix is one, uh, actin filaments that are in muscle. You have the thin filaments and the thick filaments in muscle, and they pull against one another and your muscles contract. These can be studied very well by electron cryomyscopy. You see these strands with the helices. You take pictures of them, you average them. The, the, the way you do the averaging just involves a different geometry. So single particles, you have to find the orientation. Uh, a helix, you have a, a predicted geometrical arrangement of one subunit to the next. And then the next level of arrangement upwards is a two-dimensional crystal, where you have a single layer where you have um, a direction for one axis and another direction for the, the A axis and the B axis, and this is called electron crystallography. And that was easier initially because you have in one crystal perhaps 10,000 molecules in the same orientation. And then the final one is uh, when you go away from single particles, helices, or 2D crystals, you go to general structures. And then uh, people do what's called uh, electron cryotomography. That means you take a single specimen with no repeating and multiple structures, you take views from all the different angles, say minus 70 to plus 70 degrees, and then you do a tomogram, just like with, we had with our brain tumor. And those, that gives you the range of different specimens that you can do uh, using cry, uh, electron cryo microscopy. And using these methods now, um, we now have the structures of hundreds or thousands of different uh, molecules that were resistant to other methods, for example, uh, X-ray crystallography or nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy. So in the last three years, there have been technical improvements. 
The computer programs are now much better and more powerful, but particularly there was a new generation of uh, direct electron detectors. Instead of using film, we now have new solid state silicon based devices. And this has improved the signal to noise ratio of the images. So now we have what was called by Werner Kuhlbrandt in 2014, the resolution revolution. So prior to 2010, you could do big structures at high resolution. You could do little structures, but they were tended to be blobs. And electron cryomicroscopists were termed in a derogatory way, blobologists. But now we have the resolution resolu revolution, and now all of the structural biologists are piling into electron cryomicroscopy. So it's now become a very powerful method that people who know have no background whatsoever in electron cryomicroscopy. Now they're, uh, they're, they're joining the field and there's a big uh, increase in the number of uh, research departments, universities, research institutes that are investing in electron cryomicroscopy. And now there aren't enough people to staff all the different facilities that people would like to, um, to build. So I think we can say that electron cryomicroscopy has now become uh, a very powerful method, perhaps the dominant method in structural biology.